Go Let on. me ask you one more question. Uh, I ask this as um, as somebody who's largely grown up in Bombay. The the idea of the Northeast and the stories from here, uh, as you said, are extremely underreported. And even though there are a few independent voices like yours now, how difficult is it for you to convince mainstream media to a, either fund and even if not fund to eventually publish the kind of storytelling that you are doing. I also ask this because with mainstream media in which is largely Bombay and Delhi centric, largely Delhi centric, uh, it's becoming uh, tougher and tougher to do basic reporting anywhere. Forget an underreported zone like the Northeast, but with budgets shrinking the way they are, and today you just put 10 talking heads uh, in, in a newsroom, budgets are, uh, I mean, at least the budgets that they want to give out are at an all-time low. So how difficult has it been for you, and what is the way forward for these stories to not just be documented, but for, the, for them to eventually reach the person who's going to receive that story? See, through the years I've had a couple of grants. One kind of fell through because of so many reasons. I had another one uh, and Orko was there with me when the grant money first came through, which allowed me, you know, actually I was extremely happy, allowed me to like continue doing the work, otherwise I would have gone back. Money would have run out. Uh, but beyond the grant money for that year, I must have, you know, spent much more than the grant money also. I went beyond the grant period to do more work because it was allowing, it was, you know, it was more like a seed grant for me, even though it was decent amount of money. But I said, you know, I have this opportunity. I want to like add to this work. I want to produce more work. So I just added some of my own money and thankfully post the grant, you know, I had more commissions. Uh, obviously, loads of people wanted to publish stuff. Uh, but coming to your question about Reporting budgets dwindling. Of course, they're dwindling. See, most of the reporting I do, I know a few editors who are happy to publish it. They're happy to publish it in payment or honorarium, so to speak. Uh, and the money comes through on time with at least one or two, two of the guys that I work. But they would, they don't have the budget to send somebody out. And I, for a 1400 word piece, I work 15 days. Yeah. I work really hard at reporting because I'm doing multiple things. I'm reporting, I'm doing some video also because I've, it's important that I am there. So, and But having the backing of somebody who's happy to publish what you're going to write uh, is important. It's also important for the people who you're reporting about because they're expecting a story to come out somewhere. So they'll think, well, why is this guy here? He's 14 days he's going around talking. Normally some guy comes and... They, in two days they'll finish the reporting and something is out. But I think like good, strong, tight-knit written stories also take a little bit of time. Uh, which is something which is not being, you know, uh, even news, newspaper, magazine people are not spending time reporting. Even though magazines were, uh, were reporting properly, you know, in, in this story on Nagaland blockade that I wrote, uh, it was very interesting that nobody had gone into the Naga areas to talk to the guys who who were organizing the blockade. And it's so easy, it's not very difficult. It's very, very easy. So either they were being stopped in Impal or people were just not making the effort. And I watched the situation unfold for a month and a half. I said, there's, there's no work coming out. So I went there last December and I reported about it. Because I think it was an important story because that area keeps, you know, blockades and, you know, there's this ongoing tension between the Nagas and the Maites. I think it was also for my own understanding. Now, the money that I get doesn't even cover my tickets sometimes. But I choose to report it because it, I think it's important. I'm also lucky to have a lot more commissions uh, from which I put aside some money for, my, for the work that I do. Because I didn't become a photographer and a journalist to only work on commission stories and especially a freelancer. Freelance, being a freelancer, you know, accords you the time to go out and do your work, you know, and that work is really important to me. And the relationships, of course, that I make with people when I go out, 
those are finally more important to me even than the photographs or anything else that I'm going to do. I have more friends in the Northeast than I have back in Delhi actually. So who I talk to like every day on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, please. Please somebody give me the microphone. Hello Vic. Hi. Hi. As you said after showing the video that uh, you wanted us to feel what you felt while shooting those videos, right? Or kind of experience uh, yeah. the kind of sights and sounds that one sees out there in the field if, you know, okay. once you're there, yeah. So I believe there was quite a lot of disturbance like in terms of emotional aspect. Like, yes. Uh, as we saw some people <coughs> screaming in pain and some people dying maybe. So maybe sometimes you will also have to uh, reach into the homes of those people while their relatives are there and people close to them are there. Yes. Like then how do you deal with the emotional aspect of that? Like how do you uh, uh, deal with the dilemma of whether whether should I go there and shoot? And I mean after all it's human pain. So maybe... I only shoot if I'm allowed to. Okay. That's very important. So yeah. when I enter somebody's personal space, uh, you know, I'm not going to go to them with a release form and say, you know, can I shoot you? <coughs> but like I said, the generosity of people has allowed me to do that. So when I'm entering, <coughs> excuse me, entering a person's space, there's almost this unspoken uh, thing uh, in the environment which which tells me that is it okay for me to shoot this or not? So I'm very gentle in my movements, you know, I always look for a nodding head, is it okay to do it? And only if it's okay to do it will I do it, otherwise I will not do it. Otherwise I much, you know, not everything is worth a photographic image. Sometimes you just have to stand there and uh, grieve with the rest of the family, you know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, Vivek. Hi, how are you? Building on that, uh, I just want to add another question to it, yeah. that when you are reporting and reporting two different frontiers or at least two different groups with contrasting ideologies, yeah, yeah. how do you uh, control yourself from getting biased? At least, uh, or I, I would say not biased, uh, being influenced by their ideology or you know, by the facts they provide. I only speak through the people who talk to me, actually, and whoever I meet. So if it's two opposing ideologies I'm reporting on in a single story. So if it's, it's two opposing ideologies that I'm reporting on in a single story, I'll put everyone's point forth. But I will not say anything because I'm not supposed to say anything, right? It's through the people's voices. but. But there's a way of navigating that, you know, how do you, like, your question is, how do I not get personally influenced? I mean, how do you hold the middle ground? Middle ground is uh, being fair. You should be fair, I think. And in fair in the way you report. So if I'm going to, like, talk about a situation in Chorachampur from a cookie voice and from a zoo voice, then I'll talk to both people. And they'll tell me. And they'll tell me because I'm a reporter. And there's great privilege in being a reporter. Everyone talks to a reporter. So a politician will talk to a reporter. Somebody selling peanuts will talk to a reporter. Uh, you have access to, uh, you know, rebel factions will talk to you. Uh, in the government, you, people will talk to you. Bureaucrats will talk to you. Army guys will talk to you. Uh, you know, all kinds of people will talk to you. So you have that luxury. Uh, like I said, but you must leave your prejudices behind. It is so important. Especially when you are reporting in an area that you have little or no knowledge about. Because how much ever you read, the customs, everything, you know. So you have to kind of try and blend in and be kind to people. Always be kind to people and they will be kind back to you and they will help you report. In any area, I think. In any area. People really take care of you. I am here today only because I was taken care of. You know, by the people who I report, who I was reporting about, mostly. So I really hand that down to everyone in the northeast, extremely hospitable that way. 
in whatever kind of situation, Arka and I were there in Kati Anglong. And uh, at least when everything was sharp, there was uh, a sweet soul who opened a room for us, uh, another sweet soul who sold us boiled eggs, because there's nothing available. So yeah, I mean, he knows that he's done a fair bit of reporting in the field. He'll agree with me on this. But that just be kind and, and people will help you navigate here. Yeah? Of course, you'll have disagreements over things, and, but you learn to write them over, you know, and continue doing the work that you do. And try to be truthful, yeah? Truth is sacred, I think. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Hi, Vivek. Hi, hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is that uh, through your talk, we got to know that your work span has been for a long, long time through, uh, following a particular subject. Uh, how do you keep yourself going for that? I initially said, you know, first I, was, I went looking for the story, right? But then the story pulls you in and I, if you think it's... Uh, it's an ongoing crisis that's not going to resolve itself in some time. I think it's the, the journalist's responsibility also, as it should be for all media, uh, to follow stories, to not let people forget, you know, and to go back and report when people start to forget about it. Right? So, uh, for example, if I want to know what's happening with the displaced people, it's been five years since the 2012 riots. Why is nobody going and reporting about it? Because it's still an ongoing crisis. In the winter, it gets worse. Are, are, do people have enough to, you know, fight the cold? People have to go back and meet the same people again and again. I think it's uh, it's more a long-form approach that I have to, at least my own, that keeps me going. Uh, that I don't want to let a story go, totally. Because you have to keep going through to hook up a crook, you have to like, you know, lower money, you find a way of, you know, funding yourself to go and do this because it's important, you know. And, it's, and, and I feel that responsibility and that's why, that's what keeps me going for years and years. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi Vivek, uh, before I ask you the question, I just wanted you to know something about uh, like what kind of a person I am and why I am asking you that question. Yes. Uh, I'm that person you'll find in the bus who's just the passenger, okay. who's not going to like react to the situation, but is going to like see, observe, and like uh, preserve it in within. So I spoke to a lot of people in this short period of uh, 2016 to 17 uh, right now, and uh, whenever somebody like uh, even a person who's not that famous or has not reached that high, according to that person itself. Yeah. He asks me that, uh, could you please tell me something about the place you belong to? I uh, may not uh, be surprised at that moment, but within I know that I am surprised. Like, why Northeast? You are from Delhi, as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. So why Northeast was my question, because I find people not interested in Northeast. And that is the reason I'm asking you, why did you choose Northeast? No, there's not a big thought process behind it, let me tell you. It's very simple. It was very simple for me and I and I spoke about it a little, little while back. I was really bored uh, in Delhi. I was doing these crazy stupid assignments all day. Not stupid because there's learning in everything. And But at least at that point in time, uh, I was naive or whatever and I was looking for stories to work on and I was especially looking for stories to work on which other people were not working on regularly, right? So, you know, I found this list online by Medicine Sound Frontier uh, in which Northeast India was one of the six most underreported areas in the world. They came out of the list so in 20, 2005, Northeast India was on that list. And then I started to do my research as a journalist. I want to know more. I was also a curious person, you know. So my curiosity essentially led me here. And once, you know, so like I said, I went looking for the story first because I didn't know what I was going to get on my first ever trip. And then the story kind of like latches on and, you know, keeps pulling you back. And then the people you meet, the relationships you make, keeps pulling you back. And, you know, that's why the Northeast and one thing led to the other. So, like I said, there's not a big thought process about it. Uh, I wanted to report from here and also understand. 
you know, that it remains, why we suppose it remaining so underreported, it still remains highly underreported because, you know, I don't want to only report about the elections. There are other things to report about, which is like an ongoing crisis, like let's talk, for example, the brews here. They are only in the news when Supreme Court scolds the government about, you know, he, they were being given once bar of soap, a piece of cloth, or a trouser, once a year. And bucket in some rice, very low quality rice. And so if they are only in the news, it's an ongoing crisis. Why aren't people here in Tripura not doing something about it? Or people from Mizoram? I don't know, you know. Because these stories, like, it's actually northeast. It's the most diverse re re region in all of Asia. Most diverse re region. And therefore, it's a treasure trove of stories for people who already live here. But maybe, just like myself, they might want to go to Delhi or maybe uh, Madhya Pradesh and do some reporting over there. And there's no harm in that. We are free to go anywhere to report on the subjects that we care about the most. And I think uh, I really care about uh, the stories that I work on. And I'm not an authority on it, but I try and do my little bit, you know, going back and forth. And now, you know, like whoever wants help, I'm just trying to help because I think, you know, there's a, a lot of good talent here and it shouldn't go waste. And uh, this festival is one of the places where, you know, people can meet and it should become a destination actually for more people, more photographers to come talk about their work. Uh, and for people to share their experiences. I'm sure like their experiences will grow through the year as well. I'm happy to help through emails, whatever, and you can sit down, like talk. Yeah? Uh, the other thing was, uh, you've been through a lot of turmoil in Northeast through your projects. It could be like evident, it was evident. Uh, do you regret a single day of your work? No, I don't regret any single day of my work. I don't. Somebody has to be there, right? Exactly. We are supposed to be witnesses to this to remind people that you know, this spasmodic bloodshed should, should stop. And why is it happening? To question. And that's that's our job, to question through images, through videos, whatever, through the reporting that you do, and uh, to find ways and avenues to publish this stuff. It's important. You know, I think if more people did this work, it would be so good, you know. If more people were more committed in, you know, bringing forth these stories, you know, it would be just a great thing because that's the only way things can stop, actually. Yeah. Thank you so much.